you have heard the expression, to err is human. I'd like to change that expression for my lesson tonight. To be tempted is human. That's why I had uh, Aaron read that scripture, because it talks about Jesus being the great high priest who was tempted in every way that we are tempted as humans, yet without sin. He was human in every way that we are human. He also was divine in every way that God the Father and the Holy Spirit are divine. The only unique Son of God that's ever walked the face of the earth. There will be no one like Him. In His humanity, He was tempted. And we have to understand, as we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4, and look at the intense temptations that Satan gave to Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry, that to be tempted is not wrong, but to give in to temptation is sin. You know, when you're fishing, the fish is not caught if it is going after the lure. If it is enticed by that lure that you're using. But it is caught when it grabs on, when the, when the hook is set in the fish's mouth. We have to understand that temptation is part of being human. And we're going to see here as we read Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and we're going to talk about the temptation of Christ here. We're going to see how Jesus, as a human, resisted temptation. And we have to understand this as we look at this. Jesus is being tempted in Matthew chapter 4 as a human being the way humans are tempted. Now there is something special about this in that Satan is literally speaking to him, tempting him. That would be a little bit different than the temptations that we face. But the concept of temptation is still the same here in Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to see how Jesus as a human resisted temptation. He, excuse me, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Matthew writes, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights afterwards, he was hungry. And when the tempter had come to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Look at verse 8. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, verse 10, away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Verse 11 Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. This is right after his baptism. You read about that in Matthew chapter 3. He's baptized by John in the Jordan River. And you notice there in verse 1 that this is a period of testing for the Son of God. It says in verse 1, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit is leading him to go through this testing process. We have to understand that this was God's will that he be tested. That he undergo these temptations. And therefore, let's analyze these temptations as we see them in the context of of Matthew chapter 4 and see how the devil used temptation and how Jesus resisted those temptations. Look at verse 2. It says, And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. 
You know, John chapter 1 and verse 14 tells us that the Word became flesh. God became flesh. So in His flesh, He would get hungry just like anyone would get hungry. He would need food just like any human being would need, need food for biological functions to continue. And therefore He was hungry, but He had dedicated a fast to God. And here is temptation number one. Verse 3, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Here we have Satan appearing to Jesus. He might have appeared in a physical way, but we know he audibly spoke to Christ here because it says he said to him, If you're the Son of God, you have this power, command that these stones that are all about you to become bread and you can eat. Well, there's nothing wrong with eating food. There's nothing wrong with satisfying the legitimate desire of hunger. But keep in mind, we're in a context here of Jesus fasting. He has dedicated a fast to God. And therefore, you can't fast if you eat. And so he would have to break his fast to eat. And so in this situation here... Satan was trying to get Christ to use his powers to fulfill his fleshly desires, even though those desires were legitimate in normal circumstances. Within the context of this fast, he would have to break the fast that he's dedicating to God to eat. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And we know Jesus could have done that. We know that in John chapter 2 that Jesus turned water into wine what we would call non-alcoholic wine. And therefore, we know he had the power to change the molecular structure of the the stones and the rocks into something that he could eat. He's, after all, the creator. He had that power. But notice how he resisted. Jesus said there in verse 4, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Notice how he resists this temptation. Jesus does not perform a miracle to resist the temptation. Jesus does not in any way perform some miraculous activity in order to strengthen him to get stronger, to resist the devil's offer. And you know, during a fast, he would have been intensely hungry. That would have been a very tempting offer to do that. To turn those rocks into bread. But he appeals to the power of the Word of God. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3 is what he's appealing to. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So Jesus, as a human, being tempted, he resisted this temptation by appealing to Scripture. Going to the Word of God. He had it in his heart. He knew what the Bible said. And the point of him responding this way is, there are some things more important than physical food. Man shall live. Notice he uses the word man there. He's man. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, we truly live when we submit to the will of God. Now we eat to survive. We eat to live in this world. But it does not, it is not something that we do that has more importance than spiritual matters. He is letting uh, Satan know that his priorities are spiritual, not on his physical well-being. He is resisting this temptation. This goes to the next one. You see, the devil is not going to give up. He'll try every type of temptation to get us, and he'll see what works. He'll throw it at us, each one. The thing with Christ is, everything that was thrown at Christ, he resisted. But with us, he throws temptations at us and see what will stick. See what we will give into. He's like a fisherman out there with his box of lures. He's trying to see what will get us. And he's trying to see what will entice and get Jesus to sin. Now look at verse 5. 
Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Here we have Satan transporting Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. Most likely this is a miraculous transportation from one point to another because normally he would not be able to get to the highest point of the temple. The holy city in which the temple was, you had the pinnacle of the temple. And this was probably referring to the southeast corner of the temple area, the top of which was some 300 feet above the floor of the Kidron Valley. So there would be a 300 foot drop there. And so Satan somehow miraculously transported Christ to this area, brought him to the pinnacle of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, you can prove this and to everyone who's watching by throwing yourself down. And you notice the devil quotes scripture. Do you know the devil quotes scripture? There's a lot of his servants this very day quoting scripture. And you see him here quoting scripture. He says, you throw yourself down according to these scriptures here. As he is quoting from Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. He says, he shall give his angels charge over you. His angels are going to protect you. And in their hands they'll bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. You, you cast yourself off into the Kidron Valley there's going to be angels that swoop down and rescue you. And can you imagine how that would make an impact on the Jewish people to see this man come down with angels protecting him from being killed from that 300 foot drop? Appealing to him. Appealing to that pride. He already appealed to his flesh, the lust of the flesh with the bread. Now he's appealing to with the pride of life. They'll see these angels come and they'll protect you. But you see, the devil may quote Scripture, but he mishandles Scripture. And that's exactly what you have here. And notice how Jesus responds. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. The point is, the verses that Satan quoted to Jesus have to be placed in a proper context. The context is that under ordinary circumstances, God will provid providentially protect His people. And that angels will be involved in that. And we know that's true in the New Testament as well. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14. That angels in are involved in serving those who will inherit salvation. That's behind the scenes. That's in the realm of the spiritual that we cannot detect with our senses. And so under normal circumstances, there is that protection. There is God's providential care of His people. However, you don't put God to the test. You don't go out there and purposely put yourself in danger to see whether He will actually protect you. That would be foolish. That would be foolish for someone to say, well, I'm a Christian, God has angels that are involved in protecting me, and I believe that, so I'm going to just walk out here on Interstate 30 in front of a semi, and those angels will swoop down and carry me to safety. That's foolish. Because you don't put yourself in un unnecessary danger like that to tempt God. And that's the context there of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You're not going to put Him to the test because if you do, He's not going to suspend the laws of physics to save you. You're going to get hurt just like everyone else does when you start tempting Him. So here you have Jesus resisting this temptation. Here, the second one that is being given to Christ. And notice what He does. It is written again. He takes what Satan took out of context and placed it in proper context. And that's what we got to do. Because when temptation comes, usually it will come in the form of people uh, saying, uh, the scriptures say this, 
therefore certain things are okay. I gave reference earlier to Jesus turning water to wine. And people will use that verse there in John chapter 2 and say, then it's okay for us to drink beer. See how the devil works? But we have to put that in proper context. The usage of that word, how it was used, how Jesus would have responded in, in, in a realm of drunkenness. Would he be promoting something that is so detrimental to people's well-being, both physically and spiritually? Of course, the answer to that is no. Therefore, we have to properly place Scripture in its context and not put God to the test. We are not to tempt the Lord our God. Okay, let's go to the third temptation. The devil, again, is not going to give up. Again, verse 8, the devil took him on an exceedingly high mountain. Again, from the pinnacle of the temple to an exceedingly high mountain, the devil took him perhaps some sort of miraculous transportation there, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. See, the devil has never changed his M.O. He never changed his M.O., his mode of operation. He just updates it for every generation. And so he's showing these things to Jesus. Showing all these kingdoms of the world. And evidently this must have been some sort of miraculous vision because you can't from one mountaintop see all the kingdoms in the world in one spot. But he says to him in verse 9, said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. I'll give you all these kingdoms. If you'll fall down and worship me. You want to be ruler of all? You want to be king of kings and lord of lords? Worship me and I'll make it happen. I'll make it happen for you. And notice the response of Christ there in verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Verse 11 says, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. He is quoting now from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13, and in that you worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. You are to do the things that are pleasing in the sight of God and worship Him, whether it's Satan or anyone else. We are not to put anyone or anything before the Lord whether it be a false religion, whether it be an unscriptural relationship, whether it be some sort of behavior that is detrimental to our health, detrimental to our spiritual well-being, we're not to put anything before the Lord. And therefore, you see Jesus resisting this, this temptation. And what does He do? He appeals to the Scripture. Three temptations, and He resists them all, By the power of the Word of God. And so Satan leaves him. In another account, it says that he leaves him for an opportune time. This is not the last time that Satan is going to try to tempt him. There will be other temptations throughout his life. Even to the very point of the cross. Where they're at the feet of the cross there. They're speaking to Jesus. Come down from the cross. I believe that was Satan tempting Jesus. Come out off the cross. We'll believe you. Come down and we will recognize you if you are the Son of God. Those religious leaders as they mocked him. So those temptations lasted throughout his life, but he resisted them. And notice the example that we have for us. And someone said, well, I'm facing all kinds of temptations in my life. How can I do this? I just want God to intervene. I just want him to just... Take away those temptations. I want him to intervene and just take them all away. It's not going to happen. But he does give us the power to overcome them. How? It is written. If that's how the Son of God resisted one-on-one temptation with with the devil himself, what about us? It is written. We've got to go to the power of God's Word. 
2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. It makes us complete for everything. It is the power of God and the salvation. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Therefore, that tells us that we need to get God's word in our heart. We have to have it in our mind. And so when we face those temptations, we can say it is written. I will not do this because it is written. That's how our Lord resisted temptation. And that's how we can as well. As a result of resisting temptation, he became the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. He had no sin of his own, so he could bear our sins in himself. John 1 and verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As a result, we have a, a Savior. As a result, if we put our faith in Him and confess He is the Son of God, if we repent of our sins and we obey His command to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins, His blood that He shed as the Lamb of God will take away all of our sins. And we can begin that life as a Christian with the power of God's Word to resist temptation. Perhaps there's someone here tonight that you are a Christian, but you're living in sin. We have seen how you resist it. It is written. Go to the Word of God and believe it and do it. And you will have power to overcome. If you need to repent of your sin, we urge you to confess and come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and sing.